All right, guys, we are back. Uh, we are going to talk about cyber warfare today, which is essentially nation states attacking other nation states, right? Um, and again, there's a lot of overlap between cyber warfare and cyber terrorism and cyber extremism and all those things. Um, but there are some distinctions that we're going to make. So first off, a cyber war is, is one state attacking another state. Um, it can be either accompanying a more traditional military attack, i.e., you know, tanks and planes are rolling through while we use our cyber warfare tactics, or it can be kind of on its own, where the attack is only in the cyber realm. Um, it can also be kind of targeted, or it can be large scale, right? And we've seen very few of the big large scale attacks for, of one country to another. Um, but targeted attacks are a little more common, right? These are very small. We want to attack this one specific target. We have this one very specific goal. We want to accomplish that goal. Um, and we will, you know, it's this one specific thing. Whereas the large scale attacks is just kind of throw everything at them, right? We're going to take this down. And we're going to take that down. And we're going to affect viruses in here. And we're going to do this. And we're going to do that. Um, and, and going after lots of different areas all at the same time, right? Um, there's also a difference between cyber war spying and cyber war attacking, right? So with spying, you don't want the enemy to know you were there. You just want to get in, steal some information or find out something or, you know, do something else very quietly and get back out. And then there's attacking, which is meant to kind of do as much damage as possible or to take out a specific target or to destroy a specific thing or do something, um, very impressive and big, right? Um, one of the reasons countries like cyber attacks over conventional attacks is they're, they're much harder to figure out who done it, right? So if one country attacks another, it might be weeks or months before the victim figures out that their attacker was another nation state. Especially in the midst of an attack, it can be very hard to figure out who's attacking me, right? So if the United States attacked Canada, because, you know, we don't like snow, um, we're going to attack Canada. It might be weeks or months before Canada figures out that the attack came from the United States government, right? Um, they'll almost always find out eventually, but by then it could be too late. It could be all over, right? So it's much, it's very, very difficult to figure out um, who is attacking you quickly. Um, some of the things they do for cyber war are things like disinformation campaigns, right? We want to fool your military or your people or your, your, um, intelligence networks or something and make them believe something that isn't true. Um, there was, you know, this was obviously prior to the internet, but in World War II, there was a big deal with, um, the British and the, the allies making the Germans believe that the D-Day attack was going to be, was going to happen far away from where it actually did happen. So that the Nazis would put all their um, defenses around where they thought it was going to happen and where it actually happened was going to be relatively undefended. Um, and that worked brilliantly. That was a huge, it, that program really convinced the Germans that the real attack was going to come at this place that was hundreds of miles away from where the real attack came. Um, there was another um, attack where um, Israel it, Israel sent some commandos in to attack. I can't remember what it was. It was an air defense station or something. Um, Perform some commando raid, right? Um, and the Israeli hackers essentially were able to hack into whatever country it was jordan or or um, syria or one of those neighboring countries um, was able to hack into their information network and completely hide the helicopter that brought the commandos in and then took them back out again and what they were doing so essentially that that country's military network had no idea the attack was going on until long after it was all over um, they were able to to give disinformation to that country's military about whether an attack was happening at all right? Um, one thing countries love to do is 
insert logic bombs into the network or infrastructure of their enemies, right? So I'm sure China's doing it to us, we're doing it to China, same with you know Russia and North Korea, all those countries that the United States isn't exactly friends with. Um, we will hack into their networks and they will hack into our networks and they will leave little pieces of code, very small, very innocuous pieces of code in the midst of you know the millions and millions and millions of lines of code that run the electrical grid, that run the nuclear power plants, that runs the train stations and the you know all those things. And essentially those logic bombs are if A happens, do B. And it could be if I send you this message, um, blow everything up. If I if you know you see this command sent instead of following the command, delete everything. You know, it can be, you know, it's kind of that, it's a, it's a, you know, when A happens, do B, it, you know. So um, in that case, even if they take out our ability to go back into the network to do the thing, as long as that code sits there undetected, we can still have some kind of effect, right? So let's say China breaks into our electric grid and, um, they uh, uh, see, you know, they insert some tiny little log, some tiny little code about if you hear this certain signal, shut everything down and delete all information and erase everything and just, you know, destroy the entire electric grid, right? Now we find where they hacked into our electric grid and we kick them out. So they can, they can no longer have access to the code of our electric grid, but we don't find that code that they hid while they had access. Now, all they have to do is send that signal to the network, which is vastly easier than hacking back into it, and they can, you know, have that effect, right? Um, so, one of the contentious things with cyber warfare is these organizations and groups, governments, government agencies, they have both an offensive mission and a defensive mission, i.e. it's their job to hack into the bad guys, but also prevent our systems from being hacked, right? In the United States, most of this is done by the NSA. So the NSA's job is to both attack China and Russia and North Korea, and also prevent us from being attacked by China and Russia and North Korea. Sometimes those two missions are at odds because the same software vulnerabilities that they have, we have. So the NSA, let's say the NSA finds some new zero day exploit, a new vulnerability in the Windows operating system. They have two choices. They can go offensive and say, we're gonna use this vulnerability to attack the Windows systems in China and Russia and North Korea and put in logic bombs and, and get all the information we can out of it and, and use that vulnerability for our own purposes. Or they can tell Microsoft about it. They can say, hey, there's this giant vulnerability in the Windows operating system, you need to fix it to protect the American citizens, the American government's ability to protect themselves from that same exploit. Right? So, you know, when the, if the NSA finds that vulnerability, how do they know whether the Chinese military found it months ago and is exploiting it? They don't. So they have a decision whether to do, whether to exploit that vulnerability or to fix that vulnerability. But if they fix it, it's going to fix everybody's Windows operating systems, right? You can't just keep a fix to only the continental United States. If, if Microsoft fixes that vulnerability, it's going to fix the vulnerability everywhere in the world. And then you can no longer use it as a weapon. So there was a dump recently. Somebody essentially hacked the NSA, I think. I don't remember how it came about. But the NSA released a whole giant list of all these vulnerabilities um, that they had been sitting on. They knew it was a vulnerability. They knew there were all these bugs and all this common software, everything from Windows to server software, to all this different stuff. They knew these bugs existed and they didn't tell anybody because they wanted to use them as offensive weapons rather than protecting the United States from being attacked by with using those same vulnerabilities. And it was a big kind of hubbub. 
Um, the other thing you have to worry about with cyber warfare is not all countries are you are um, susceptible in the same way, right? So if the United States had a completely crushing cyber attack against it, that would affect our citizens a lot. That would be hugely detrimental to life as an American. It would take out electric grids and, you know, all, all, if all those things went down, our lives would be hugely different. That would be very, very impactful on us as Americans. If we attack North Korea the same way, we took out their entire electric grid and all their network infrastructure and all that stuff, most of their citizens would be like, so what, right? So they don't have the vulnerability that we do because they don't have the same kind of society we do. Um, so that's something that we have to be careful of with cyber war because not all countries are susceptible the same way they are with like nuclear weapons, right? Nuclear bomb goes off. I don't care what country you're living in. That's bad news. Cyber attack happens. Well, it kind of depends on where you live, right? If you're out in the middle of nowhere of a third world country, you might not even notice it happen. Whereas if you're downtown New York City or downtown Paris, it might be a very big deal, right? So um, here's another way that, that, um, uh, cyber warfare can work. This is absolutely brilliant. This is actually a post from 4chan where it's a uh, Norwegian versus, I want to say Swedish um, war game. And so one of the Swedish guys um, looks on Tinder and he finds all these Norwegian female um, soldiers on Tinder and he notices that they're a certain distance away. So he takes one of his other soldiers to drive a motorcycle, you know, another certain distance away. And using that, they're able to triangulate where, essentially, this Norwegian military unit is. They send some scouts, some helicopters, you know, look at that area. And sure enough, there's a giant Norwegian military unit. So they, they attack it in the war game and win. And the Norwegian military can't figure out where, how they keep tracking all of their units. And it's not some fancy radio direction finder. It's not some fancy new cyber attack. It's not some fancy new piece of equipment. It's not satellites. It's Tinder, which I think is absolutely brilliant. But that's the future of cyber warfare, right? I mean, we're so integrated with everything that something like this is going to be important. And I think most of the, 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 the military generals and the politicians and all the, the big guys upstairs aren't understanding that our society is completely integrated with this. And we're going to do something stupid and like forget to tell our soldiers, hey, turn your phones off. Or hey, don't connect to Tinder while you're out in the field, uh, you know, doing military maneuvers. So, examples of nation-state versus nation-state attacks. Um, the, the, there was a big one um, back, I want to say it was 2005 or 2006, okay? So, the Soviet Union collapsed in the early 90s. Um, Estonia was a former Soviet republic, but now they're independent. And many years later, again, I think 2005, um, they decide that they're going to take down a big Soviet-era monument, that the Soviets had built when they were controlling Estonia way back in the day. They decided they were going to take down this monument and get rid of it because they're no longer Soviet, they're Estonians. Um, Russia really didn't like this. So they did a concentrated attack, a cyber attack that took down the Estonian um, government internet system. It took out their banking system for days. Like they completely crippled the entire country with different cyber attacks um, in retaliation for the removal of this monument that Russia saw as important, right? Um, a second one on the list was Stuxnet. Stuxnet was a really, really fascinating thing. I've got this entire book just about Stuxnet. It's fascinating to read. Essentially, the short version is, we don't know who it was, but it was probably the United States and Israel, created a virus and was able to infect a 
a nuclear enrichment facility in Iran that was completely not connected to the internet. They were able to get this virus into the computers of the, the companies that serviced the nuclear facility, were able to get them into those company servers. Then somebody from that company, or probably multiple people from that company, plugged in a USB drive into their computer, the, the, the Stuxnet virus got onto the USB drive, then they walked over to the Iranian nuclear facility, which was completely separated from the internet, plugged their, that same USB drive into one of their computers. Now the Iranian nuclear facility has this virus on their internal network. And what it did is it sat there, this was a brilliant, brilliant virus, really way more complicated than anything anybody had seen before this. Um, but it sat there and it essentially listened to what was happening with these nuclear enrichment machines. It figured out what was normal. It figured out what the people looking at the monitors were expecting to see. And then it made the centrifuge, because part of nuclear facilities generating weaponized plutonium is these centrifuges that spin around really, really, really fast. There were a bunch of these centrifuges and essentially the infected ones would spin too fast and, and break themselves all while telling the people monitoring them that nothing was wrong. So it completely screwed up the production of plutonium in this nuclear facility and, and set them back months, maybe years, all through a computer virus to attack the Iranian nuclear program, which it's absolutely brilliant. If, if you're at all interested in this kind of thing, I totally recommend finding a book or a good documentary or whatever all about Stuxnet because it's absolutely fascinating. Um, and then finally, the, the 2016 presidential election, right? We don't have all of the information yet. The investigation is still ongoing as of what, when I'm recording this. But right now, it looks like the Russian government directed uh, uh, hackers in their country to attack the Democratic Party and affect the 2016 presidential election in an effort to get Trump elected. Whether Trump was um, involved in this is still up in the air, but the fact that the Russian government specifically directed their hackers to do everything they could to try to sow division amongst the American electorate and try to influence people to not vote for Hillary Clinton or to vote for Donald Trump um, is pretty clear. And that, I mean, that's, that's an attack. That is a war, um, a, a um, nation state attacking another nation state via cyber methods, right? Um, so what do we do about it? Well, the NSA is kind of the leader in the United States, right? They protect the country from both cyber warfare and cyber attacks and cyber, cyber warfare and cyber terrorism. They have a dual job. They're both the offensive and defensive um, people. So as discussed earlier, they have a hard time sometimes determining when to fix holes to defend us and when to exploit holes to attack others. Um, one of their programs that they had uh, was PRISM. And PRISM was a huge data gathering operation where essentially anybody that had any contact with anybody outside of the country so if an American citizen had a phone call or sent an email to somebody outside of the country, the NSA captured it. And then if they had a suspected terrorist, they could look at everybody in the United States he called and emailed and texted. And it was this giant data gathering program that was, for what I hope are obvious reasons, civil rights groups had a big problem with. So they got very up in arms and officially PRISM is shut down. Whether there's a similar program going on right now, I don't know. I can't say. Um, but the NSA was doing a huge amount of data collection on American citizens. Um, U.S. Cyber Command is the military branch that does very similar to what NSA does, but for the military specifically. So they do offensive military operations and defensive military cyber operations. They defend the military's networks. They attack enemy military networks. Um, they do all kinds of um, both offensive and defensive cyber stuff. And the hackers that work for them are wearing a uniform. You know, Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, whatever. 
they hire hackers. They get hackers into the military and train them how to do offense and defense. Um, the Department of Energy is the federal agency responsible for protecting the power grid and the power plants. And interestingly, also, the nuclear weapons. All of the nuclear weapons in the United States are not under the command of the Department of Defense. They're under the command of the Department of Energy. Um, the FBI has a big role, and, the, and Homeland Security both have a big role in protecting Americans from terrorism, whether it's, you know, bombs or planes or cyber. So they have a big defensive role in protecting American citizens, not just government networks, not just military networks, but American citizens from cyber terrorism, cyber attacks, um, and kind of, you know, any of those crimes that would very obviously affect the country negatively. Anyway, that is the end of this chapter. Thank you guys so much. I'll see you next time.